All right. <clears throat> well, late good morning to you. And I guess I'm the one thing that's standing between you and lunch at this point. Oh, tough act. OK. Uh, I am not as politically correct as some of our, my predecessors about our name changes. But as you can see, there's a common theme about our uh, frustration with it. Uh, it's just one sign going up and another one being pulled down after the next. And I don't know that that's what our next logo is going to be. Apparently, that's for, I think, uh, American University. But it has AU in it. It's, it's going to be something like what we're going to get. Whatever. So um, head CT scan uh, reading uh, made easy was the topic that I was asked to cover. Uh, and I'd say most of you are probably quite used to uh, simply getting a radiology report that says, you know, here's, here's the results of the CT scan. That's all fine and dandy. But, you know, what is the history that the radiologist usually gets? It's usually what? Syncope? Headache? Uh, chest pain, and you forgot to mention the other part about the syncope or whatever. Uh, not dense right hemiparesis in the upper extremity, greater than the lower extremity, to tell the radiologist where to be focusing their attention. So they miss stuff uh, based on the limited examination that they get, which is none. <clears throat> so uh, CT scanners have come along a little bit from the old CT scanners, but I thought this was just kind of fun, uh, just the history of the CT scanner back in the early 70s. Uh, two guys, uh, Hounsfeld and McCormick, uh, developed a CT scanner just for doing the head. Uh, this was their early prototype. Uh, and it gave you wonderful CT scan uh, resolution. I mean, stuff that you could really do lots with. Yeah, not so much. Uh, but uh, the technology has obviously improved quite a bit. We now have newer CT scanners uh, that are very high resolution, super duper fast. I mean, these 640 slice CT scanners that have the fixed array, uh, multiple targeting uh, places with the electron beam that's, that's zipping around as you just do a helical scan and basically can do a, a CT scan of the beating heart within one second and take a look at the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, coronary artery bypass grafts to see if they're patent as you're watching the flow move through that vessel. It's incredible the resolution of that stuff. So, but someone's got to read the scan and I like looking at all my own CT scans. Uh, some we have a teaching institution, so a lot of times I get a resident read. So it may not always be accurate, and I know what I'm looking for, and they may not know what I'm what I'm looking for. Uh, without belaboring this, you do have to have to know a little bit of something about Hounsfield units. If you're looking at your CT scans, it's kind of done for you largely because you can do uh, certain presets. You can do a bone window. You can do a uh, fat window. You can do a muscle window. You can do a lung window. Uh, whatever. Uh, relevant to the body part that you're looking at. And there's also a brain window, as well as the bone window, because you look at both. Because uh, sometimes there's more than one thing going on. Patient has a stroke and falls and smacks their face on the ground and has maybe lots of facial fractures. So if you only look at the brain window, you're going to miss the, the facial fractures. So different attenuation windows are going to give you different results. And it's all, you know, all the same slice, uh, but just different windows. You can see that there are different things that you're going to pick up on uh, based on that. OK, so you decided, I'm going to spin this patient's head. <clears throat> and if you're reading by yourself, then of course, you need to do those basics that you learned maybe as a medical student or ever early in your training. Make sure that you got the right study. Is it on the right patient? Is it the correct date? I've had all these errors happen to me. And because I am a little um, more anal about that stuff, I've picked up on it, sometimes a little later than I wanted to. Uh, make sure that you're looking at it correctly. You've got to turn correctly. If you're using the, the hard copies, you know, but everything's moving on to digital, so it's kind of taken care of largely. Uh, but if the clinical picture doesn't fit the images that you're seeing, there's probably something wrong, and it's probably the wrong study. Okay, Arrow through the head versus nails. Um, I hope that's a cadaveric experiment. That's pretty awful. Uh, or gunshot wound to the head. OK, so you got the right scan, and you got it turned all, all right, correctly. Now how do you start? Right? So much stuff to look at uh, in, so many, uh, in, in the series. It's not just you know, single chest x-ray done. Uh, you got to do all that. So I'm going to uh, go through a system that's out there and give credit to Dr. Perone, who uh, published this quite a while back. I've made some of my own edits and added my own images to this. But it's a very simple mnemonic that you can remember. Blood can be very bad. Usually is, right, if it's not in the right place. So, uh, so with that mnemonic, you're going to take a look at the CT scan and look specifically for blood. You're going to look at the cisterns. You're going to look at the brain tissue itself, looking for symmetry and some other things. You're going to look at the ventricles and finally look at the bone. And when you've done all that, you're done. Easy, right? <clears throat> OK. So we'll go through lots of images here in this next session. I'm glad, glad we've got the lights turned down a little bit. So for that first piece, blood, uh, we're going to look for epidural hematomas, subdural hematomas, uh, interparenchymal bleeds, intraventricular bleeds, as well as the subarachnoid hemorrhages, the other stroke. Okay. So let's just jump right into that. 
with lots of images. In the original version of this, which is normally about an hour long lecture, I don't give the answer at the top of the slide. Uh, I make you think about it, but we're not going to have time for that. So, uh, epidural hematoma. Let's see if I point it. Yes. So, we have a beautiful lens shaped hematoma here. Uh, we're not going to have time to go into histories on patients. So, this is one of these doorway, doorway diagnoses. You just kind of throw the, the image up, the representative image. Boom, there it is. It's, this is what it is. Move on. Okay. Uh, maybe a little hint of, a little, of uh, some uh, mass effect. The ventricle is a little collapsed over here on this side. So, epidural hematoma with a little bit of midline shift versus a subdural hematoma, which is that long sickle shell, sickle shaped uh, hematoma there along the edge of the um, uh, skull. Uh, under the dura, hence its name, subdural, probably tearing the bridging veins. Elderly patient who's fallen, looks like there's lots of atrophy on this, on the CT scan. And loss of the ventricles on that side because of the mass effect. Uh, might actually have uh, not too many complaints. Might, might have a little depression of his mental status. You're going to do septic work on this guy as, as you're doing your CT scan, and boom, there it is, lo and behold. And you're going to call your nurse surgeon who's going to complain, eh, I've got a whole lot of midline shaft, not going to do anything, a minimum to neurology. And I'll see the patient again in the morning. He needs another CT scan in 12 hours. Ugh. Okay. <clears throat> we know how that goes. How about this one? Well, the answer is at the top. So we have a chronic subdural hematoma versus, an, uh, in addition to an acute subdural hematoma. Now, how do we know that? Uh, acute blood is bright white on the CT scan. It's just what it does. It's just bright white. As soon as it clots, it turns bright white. So that's all this bright white stuff. But clot breaks down. It doesn't stay there forever. It breaks down. But in the meantime, the brain stays deformed because that clot's been sitting there so long. So you end up with what's a lot of times called cystic hygroma or the chronic subdural, which is this black thing. So a few days ago, this guy had this big black thing here from a fall uh, where they uh, got subdural hematoma, I don't know, months, years ago. And now he's bled back into it and blood layers out because he's been laying uh, with, you know, nose up, back of the head down, and it's just layered out. And when you get CT scan, you see this beautiful meniscus where the blood's layered out and the old subdural's there. Easy peasy, right? Take another one here. Um, sometimes the subdural uh, will move along slightly different uh, paths. So here it is along the skull, but it's also moving along the falks. So there's hematoma on this side, but not on the other side. A lot of this ends up being kind of pattern recognition. Once you've seen it, you'll recognize it again. If you've never seen it, kind of describing it in a textbook, and you, uh, if you've seen the picture, it's like, hey, this reminds me of something I've seen before. I need to look a little closer. Yeah, I can figure this out. <clears throat> All right, a parenchymal bleed. So blood right into the tissue. So we're looking at the brain tissue, and white is bad. And there it is, big, big bleed. A uh, little bit of mass effect. The ventricle down here and the posterior horn is gone. And here's another bleed. Uh, this one is extending on into the ventricle itself. Uh, these bleeds will sometimes do that. They just don't have enough, have enough room in the tissue. Looks like there's actually a little bit of edema around it as well. Uh, and he's spilling on into the ventricle. Fair amount of midline shift there as well. And you're supposed to be able to get copies of all these things afterward, somehow. Maybe part of that YouTube thing. Uh, so if you're not catching it quick enough here today, you can always go back to this again. And you can, anything, you can always Google it. If you're not quite sure, I've heard of this at least before. Let me see some of the additional uh, representative images. Mr. Google is always very, very helpful when you do an image search. Um, OK, so here we have blood inside the ventricle itself. I mean, it's packed full. This person's going to need a drain by the neurosurgeon. He's going to have a very small target to hit uh, because all this blood's going to clog up the rest of the uh, uh, drainage system of the uh, CSF. So they're going to build up intracranial pressure massively. So this is, this is quite ominous. <coughs> Uh, oh, from a parenchymal bleed here posteriorly. And again, there's some edema there in the tissue of the brain itself. All right, um, more blood. This happens to be in the supracellar cistern. We're going to come to the cisterns in a minute. Uh, this is a very obvious one. Uh, see a nice big star man or starfish sitting in the middle? Bright white? Bad. Okay. And what lives in this territory? The circle of Willis lives right here. That's where all your aneurysm or most of your aneurysms appear from. So 75, 85% of the time, uh, folks have aneurysms that are bleeding. That's, that's the location. That's where you're going to be looking first if you're thinking an aneurysm will bleed. And as soon as you flash the CT scan, you see this. Uh, the starfish, and then the CT scans like subarachnoid hemorrhage, we need to go uh, to whatever arterial study uh, you do at your facility. MRA, CTA, 
uh, arteriogram, whatever they do, whatever your neurosurgeons are used to and your radiologists are used to. Don't forget to look outside the brain. So in this case, big scalp hematoma here, All right? You probably picked that up on clinical exam as well, but just don't forget to look at it and then you're gonna be interested in doing the bone windows to see if there's a skull fracture underneath there. Okay, so that's blood. So let's move on to the cisterns. So cisterns are these fluid baffles that we have inside of our brain. Uh, just, just places where fluid uh, moves on through uh, as it's making its circulation around the uh, brain. It's a little bit different from the ventricles. We'll come to ventricles when we get to V. Uh, and there's four cisterns that we need to take a look at. The, we, I think we couldn't squeeze any more letters into that word, circumesencephalic, um, the supercellar, the quadrigeminal, and the sylvium. So let's take a look at some examples here. So the supra uh, circumesencephalic, it is way down here toward the bottom. It is, it is this ring around, a lot of folks will describe the brainstem here as looking a little bit like a heart with a notch on the bottom, okay? So we're taking a look at that area. So let's do this here without, here we go, the circumesencephalic cistern. And let's take a look and see what it looks like with blood in it. Looks kind of like this, all right? Here's where we're looking. Now, there's also a little incidental blood here in the sylvian fissure, some more here in the, in the midline fissure. And here, you know, since they're so close to each other, the supracellar cistern and the circumesencephalic cistern, we've got blood in both of these. Okay, circumesencephalic. So next is the supracellar cistern. Remember, we talked about the starfish just a second ago. So you can kind of see it not filled with blood here. Kind of imagine this little pentagonal thing in the center. And when we Take the, put a little blood in it. This one's a little harder to see, okay? So you have to be careful. You can't, can't just go, you know, blitz through the CT scan, you know, do, 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 done. Now, you need to look at it a little bit harder than that. But can you appreciate that? Okay, if you're going fast, you might miss it, right? <clears throat> All right, next is the quadrigeminal uh, cistern. It's kind of a W shaped. You can make out that W. And when it's filled with, whoops, when it's filled with blood, looks a bit like this. And we'll get to the sylvian fissures here in a second, but there's a little bit of blood here in the sylvian fissures. So there are the sylvian fissures right there along the temporal lobe. And there's some blood in those. Good. All right, that's our cisterns. Next, we've got brain matter itself to look at. So we're going to look for symmetry. We're going to look at something called effa uh, effacement, uh, midline shift. We kind of alluded to that already a couple of times. Hyperdensities, hypodensities, and uh, pneumocephalus. So let's jump right in. Is it symmetrical? Yeah, it is. Is it normal? No, not really, right? Not a whole lot of brain matter there, left there. Some huge ventricles, lots of atro atrophy uh, here between the gyri of the brain. Uh, Elderly patient, clearly, uh, it's probably a, 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 a ventricular uh, shunt that he's got in place uh, from long-standing hydrocephalus. It only did so much, but um, you're going to have to figure that out with the rest of the picture. What's going on here? Why did I get the CT scan? Am I concerned? Maybe it's for shunt malfunction and there's a worsening hydrocephalus compared to a previous CT scan. Okay, symmetry. Um, well, just, the story's at the bottom. That kind of clues you into what you're looking for. What do you think? Is that symmetrical? On first, just a quick glance? Yeah, it's symmetrical. Oh, wait a minute. There's kind of some hypodensity going on here, and there's something hypodense here. Oh, there's a big old area of hypodensity over here that doesn't look like that side. So this person's throwing emboli from his heart, from his previous stab wound, uh, into his brain. He's just showering his brain regularly, uh, infarcting different sections of it. So that's not a normal CT scan. You have to look close. More symmetry. What do you think? I'm gonna give you a second just to look at that. There's brain there, yeah. It's kind of gray and fuzzy, yeah. But if you look close here, you can see there's all kinds of little lacy, fine little gray, white patterning in here. And over here, this side, that's just a big old gray blob. Over here, same thing, big old gray blob. Whereas here, you can see nice gyri. You can see gray, white uh, interfaces. Uh, so this side over here is abnormal. There's a tissue edema here from an ongoing infarct. This is bad. Uh, and 24 hours later, that, one, that same patient is looking like this, and it's a little bit easier to see now. 
But early on, it kind of gives you the clue. There is a huge infarct here. This person's going to do very terribly. Probably got a big middle cerebral artery infarct, and he's going to lose a third of his brain. Okay. And that's, that, as you can see here, the mass effect that it's causing at this point. The ventricle's collapsed, completely gone on that side. And the tissues on that side are being pushed over. Uh, you know, there's not a whole lot to do for this person. It's going to be heroics. Kind of thing you can do, elevate the head of the bed and start talking to the family about final preparations. <clears throat> or if it's, you know, all gun ho, then the neurosurgeon might be talked into taking the top off and letting the brain swell. But they will not do well. Okay, so uh, we mentioned a subdural hematoma a little while ago. Is this an acute subdural hematoma, a chronic subdural hematoma, or? It's not bright white, is it? Oops. Crap. There. It's, it's not bright white, so this is not acute. This has been going on for a while, but it's not, not to the density of cerebral spinal fluid. It's not gotten to that point yet. So this is probably a week or two old. Uh, it's now hypodense compared to the rest of the brain tissue, but it's not completely liquefied yet. Okay? And there's considerable midline shift. It's amazing how, you know, I'm in a good position, and there's a couple of other gray-haired people here. If we whop our head and have a subdural, we'll tolerate it quite well. Whereas you youngsters, you're going to go down the toilet immediately because you don't have room in your brain, or inside your skull, to accommodate that, that hematoma or mass effect. Us old folks, we've got some atrophy going on. We can, we can hide it for a while before we decompensate. Okay? And uh, I'm feeling good about that. <laughs> in five minutes, I won't even remember that I said that. <laughs> it's even better. Um, so... Uh, these patients may not present with much, or they're a little confused, it wasn't so bad, so we kind of thought we'd watch it for a while, and then something else happens, and then they finally get brought, and then it is incidentally found. It's like, oh, crap, right? Um, so if it's been going on for a while like this, the nurse surgeon may say, yeah, we're going to continue watching it. We're not going to start stick, you know, drilling holes in there to decompress that. They're tolerating this joke quite fine. It didn't kill them right off the bat, so let's leave them alone. That's what Dr. Scheiber was alluding to earlier about you don't always want procedures done. All right, uh, nice brain abscess uh, with midline shift. Lots of edema around that. Maybe the patient's presenting with nuanced seizures. You can have pretty large tumors inside your brain before you start having symptoms of it. That's always the sneaky thing uh, with those tumors. Um, here, another brain lesion with uh, vasogenic edema around that. Mass edema. In pneumocephalus, uh, Maybe the patient complained of lightheadedness. Bad joke. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe traumatic incident, or maybe they had uh, um, lumbar puncture done using air as a contrast instead of some other contrast medium. Plenty of headache. OK, we move on to the ventricles, V. So we're going to take a look at several of our ventricles, and there are several things we're going to look for in each of those. Keep moving along here. So here's a cast of the ventricles. I always think it looks a little bit like alien, or, you know, alien versus predator. I don't know, maybe not. <clears throat> but the ventricles kind of are difficult for me to wrap, uh, wrap my brain around, no pun intended. Uh, it's, it, they're just they're hard to conceptualize uh, three-dimensionally for me. There's another representation. Pretty. Might hang it on my wall just for artwork. Okay, so um, some folks will describe the lateral ventricles as the back-to-back -back commas. So comma, comma. Uh, so you're at that level, and obviously above and below a little bit. So we take a look at those, and do those look symmetrical? Yeah? Is there something bright white in there? Yep. Is it blood? No, that's normal calcification from the choroid plexus. You don't want to remove those because that's what makes your spinal fluid. If you remove those, your brain's going to be mighty dry. You will not like that. Okay? Uh, and here's more calcification in the lateral ventricles as well as here in the pineal body. Uh, if you're not used to reading these on a regular basis, they, they're going to alarm you. I've seen some patients get transferred for those. And it's like, oh, you have normality, you can go home now. <clears throat> uh, so just be aware that those are there. Fair amount of atrophy on that brain. Uh, quite a bit of atrophy on this brain. <coughs> okay. So these are the lateral ventricles again. I'm not sure about um, opposing commas. This is more like opposing water balloons. Uh, very large, clearly. All right, well, the clue is there, but you have to tell me where the hemorrhage is. Someone says on top? You seeing hemorrhage up here someplace? Mm -hmm. 
probably blood from here because this is a little bit wide in the third ventricle. We've got our quarter plexus in the pineal body, but then we've got these little menisci down here, and that's blood that's laying in the posterior horns of the ventricles. Okay? So don't always look at the center, look at the periphery as well. All right? Lateral ventricle is collapsed. Okay? It's clearly not symmetrical. Why? Why is that ventricle collapsed? Look hard. Yeah. Yeah, some, some folks are saying it. Look closely here, there's a line right there, and everything here is kind of a uniform gray, whereas here's kind of the normal gray matter with some gyra in it. This is a huge subdural hematoma, gigantic subdural hematoma. It's isodense. It looks the same density as brain. This one's easy to miss if you're not paying attention, okay? You just say, it's like, oh, wait a minute, where's the ventricle? And why, what's happening? Something has to be making it collapse, okay? That clues you in. All right, slit like ventricles, loss of gyri. This is typically going to be something from uh, diffuse axonal injury, which you'll see with rapid deceleration injuries. So car accident, uh, person versus bridge pillar going 60 miles an hour, where the brain goes from 60 to zero, like instantaneously. Uh, brain doesn't like that, it swells up. Uh, you think a neurosurgeon's gonna be able to put a ventriculostomy drain in there to check pressures? No, okay, a very poor prognosis. It's like everything in there's been rattled around and, and jarred and is swelling. Uh, and going to die in pressure. Okay, now the third ventricle is here in the center. It's kind of the keyhole slit, but not like the, the slit like ventricles that we were talking about in a second. This one's supposed to be nice and skinny, uh, sitting right there, uh, and connects the two lateral ventricles to each other. So here's that one that we saw a minute ago, uh, and I said, it seems like there's a little bit of ha haloing around that uh, pineal body, and that ventricle is just a little bit, that third ventricle is a little bigger than it ought to be. That's probably where they bled from, and that's layered out here in the posterior horns of the uh, lateral ventricles. Fourth ventricle is down here. It's kind of helmet shaped uh, as the CSF is making its way down toward the spinal cord. And there's some blood down on the fourth ventricle. And where else do you see blood? Star. Star, which is called the supracellar cistern. Excellent. And we're down to the last one already, our fifth component, bone. That should be easy, right? So let's just go right on into that. Bone, again, windowing is important. So if, we just, if we're doing more of a brain windowing, you can see it's just kind of a blur, but if we change that, we can make out a little bit more about air and depressed fragments and it's much, much better what's going on here. Uh, we don't like thinking about sinuses, but sinuses are good to look at. Um, so sphenoid sinus, here's fluid in the sphenoid sinus. Here is a fracture in the petrous bone, and we've got our ethmoid sinuses packed full of blood or mucus or pus or whatever. Here's our ethmoid sinuses, here's the sphenoid sinuses. And don't forget about the uh, mastoid air cells. We'll take a look back here. And it looks like this person's got some blood in the sphenoid sinuses as well. Oh yeah, it says on the slide. And you've seen that once before. So penetrating injuries. Uh, so don't forget, you know, the clue may be, oh yeah, here's all that soft tissue swelling and yep, there's the stuff penetrating the cranial vault. A couple of extra special things, uh, especially in uh, doing stroke work. Um, the hyperdense MCA sign, the insular ribbon sign. So let's take a look at those. So what do you think about that CT scan? Does it look symmetrical? Yeah, it's symmetrical. Pretty much. See anything bright white? Yeah, there's a little, there's kind of this little comma thing sitting in there. Doesn't look that much, does it? You're looking at the middle cerebral artery and a clot that's embedded in it. It's completely occluded by clot, okay? That person is going to lose brain from here to there. That is a third of their brain that's gonna get wiped out because that's what it supplies uh, from vascular supply. So this is an ominous sign. This person's gonna come in with a high NH stroke score, so about 22, something like that, uh, devastated. Uh, and they're going to do very poorly uh, unless treated very aggressively and uh, TPA is probably not going to handle that by itself. It's too much clot burden. So hyperdense MCA sign. Uh, here's a follow-up CT scan on that same person. Okay, they're going to wipe out that brain. Big mass effect. In fact, uh, looks like they've actually got some spontaneous hemorrhage into the into the infarct, which happens not infrequently, especially with those large vascular territory uh, strokes. Spontaneous bleed. It's not TPA related. It's 
It's just bad tissue and as it breaks down, the blood vessels break as well. Okay, insular ribbon sign. This one's a little trickier, a little tougher. So if, there's some arrows that are here a little bit in the way, but um, you can still see a bit of that lacy gray-white uh, gray interface, and on the other side, it's kind of smudged out from the early edema uh, that's going on from the stroke. Okay. Just like the effacement that we saw earlier, uh, where that gray-white differentiation took place, um, same thing, it just happens to be right there at the insular ribbon along the sylvian fissure. So same thing here without arrows and different sides this time, okay? Normal versus abnormal. It's just, it's just a little prettier, a little cleaner, and a little smudged on this side. Uh, you're gonna get the symptoms to go along with that to kind of clue you in to where to look. And um, especially if the family says, you know, they were normal an hour ago, it's like, uh, no, this has been going on just a little bit longer. Double check your time of onset. Okay, um, so we've alluded to already that acute blood is gonna be bright white because it clots and that's just what it changed, does from the Hounsfeld attenuation uh, thing, it's going to be more dense. Blood as it breaks down becomes progressively more isodense and then finally hypodense. How fast does that happen? Uh, unfortunately, it goes to my favorite answer, which is it depends. Uh, it depends on what your hemoglobin is, it depends on how well your uh, metal system's revved up, how fast your body's breaking down the clot. Okay, so it's because it's going to depend on the usual stuff that breaks down any clot any place else in your body, the bruise on your thigh or whatever. Uh, so depending on how long all that takes and how big the clot is, uh, it's going to move along uh, different paces and different people. But this kind of gives you, throws in that general ballpark, the one to two weeks and after two weeks. Uh, picking up blood on the CT scan, particularly subarachnoid bleeds, uh, Fairly good sensitivity early on, unless it's just a small bleed, a sentinel bleed, those may be hard to pick up and your, your history is gonna be suspicious and you have to decide whether or not to move on with an LP. Uh, and as time goes on, your sensitivity just drops, uh, finally drops like a rock and it's completely useless. You still get your CT scan, but when you get it normal, it's like, eh, what do we do with that? I've gotta do something else. You don't wanna just CTA everybody because you're gonna pick up the baseline normal about 5% of aneurysms that the population has that are completely asymptomatic. And then now you've got pathology and now what? Now you move, do we do something about that? Do we observe it? You need more CT scans, lots more radiation. You've opened up a can of worms that, was that the right thing to do? Have you helped your patient in that case? I mentioned earlier that most of the aneurysms are in the circle of Willis, uh, are from the circle of Willis, an immediate adjacent area. So the supracellar cistern is where you're gonna be looking for those bleeds. And, uh, with the infarcts, I kind of alluded to it. If you start seeing infarct uh, changes on the CT scan, the infarct is probably three, four, five hours already in its age. So when people are telling you, it just started 20 minutes ago, it's like, no, there's, no, there's something wrong with this story. Let's go back and get some more history because someone's got something confused. Remember a lot of people, when you ask about when was the last no normal, they tell you when they found uh, mama, which is not what you want to know. That's totally uninteresting. When was the last time mama was normal? That's what you want to know. Uh, here's a patient with spontaneous hemorrhagic transformation from their stroke, you know, probably about a week out. Okay. So we'll, a lot of times warn uh, the uh, folks at, the, at, a, at a spoke hospital, so if you're planning on keeping this patient, just be prepared, they're probably gonna deteriorate very suddenly in a few days. Uh, there's, there's gonna be a big change, you can rescan them, but don't be surprised when you see blood, and let's prepare the family for that as well, to anticipate that there's a good chance this is gonna happen. <clears throat> So, there we covered it. Blood can be very bad. Bone cisterns, brains, ventricles, and bone. So, um, what is this? Kind of last quiz. Supercellular Super cistern and? Circumesencephalic cistern. Kind of depends on how the patient has their head tipped a little bit. Head's usually tipped a little bit on the CT scanner, so depending on how much when it's tipped and how cattywampus they are in general on the CT scanner, uh, you may pick up other places, so crap. Uh, and we also see blood in the sylvian fissures. Okay, so this blood's spread out all over the place. So, if you're looking at your own CT scan, if there's no blood, if the cisterns are all open, patent, the, blood, the brain is symmetrical, there's no bright white spots in it, uh, the ventricles are wide open, no dilation, and there's no fractures, then you can Say it's a normal CT scan and you can sleep soundly and your patient can be reassured. I saw yesterday driving in on a billboard, Fedelasta is the Azalea City, so as 
for Valdasta, I put this slide up, for hosting us. And that is that. <laughs>